Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ask Away Upper Year Q&A Panel 1 webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which Queens is located. Queens University is located on traditional, traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. As students and staff, we're grateful to live as uninvited guests upon these lands. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to be cognizant of its longer history of colonialism. It's important to recognize this land's significance for the indigenous peoples whose practices were tied to and continue to develop in relationship with the land. It is also important to understand the longstanding history of Kingston that has brought us to reside here. This significance exists beyond the historical context and is still ongoing. We need to be mindful of our present participation and the actions on these ancestral lands where we teach, learn, and live. As settlers, we understand due to colonization that we can enjoy these lands and the opportunities they have provided. In the future, we strive to represent aspects of indigeneity within our programming and will express our appreciation through continuous efforts toward equity, diversity, and inclusion. We encourage you to learn more about the Indigenous lands in Kingston through the Office of Indigenous Initiatives and the Four Directions Indigenous Student Center using their website or their on-campus resources. Now, let's move on to our speakers for today. So my name is Jonah, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Transition and Engagement Student Lead. Here with me today, I have some of our student leads from the Student Experience Office to help answer some questions. So I'll have them introduce themselves now. Hi everyone, my name is Massimo. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Student Lead of Mentorship Programs with the Student Experience Office. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alice, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a fourth year student in film and media and the Marketing and Communications Student Lead for the SEO. Hi, my name is Kirith and I use she, her pronouns. I am a third year life sciences student and I am the first year foundation student assistant with the SEO. Hi everyone, my name is Raven B and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the development program student lead here at the SEO and I am going into my fourth year of health sciences. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so in addition to these student leads, we have some other student experience office representatives on the back end to help answer any questions you may have. So feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them during or after the presentation. Getting into our Q&A, we've selected three frequently asked questions just to start. Each of us will answer them and then we'll get into your questions from the Q&A box. So the first question we have is, what are some tips for a successful transition from high school to university? I'm gonna pass it on to our speakers to provide their answers first. For me, I really used university as a time to explore myself and my interests and consider what I want to do in the future. Um, it also really helps me grow as a person, just generally finding what I'm interested in, but also learning to live independently. So I really recommend finding courses and extracurriculars that you're actually interested in. Um, even if that's just um, like an extra uh, selected course on top of your regular course load or um, joining a club that's just a personal interest club. I think those are really important to finding yourself and finding like a niche for yourself in the future. Um, I would also really recommend establishing your supports and your support systems. So um, communicating with your supporters, friends, family, and also finding on-campus groups that can help um, support you in your transition to university. Um, I'd say the best piece of advice is to really just take your time and to soak in and soak in your environment. As first year students, you're going to be looking to your peers a lot for advice and, you know, just to, you know, your friends. And just, it's really important to know that not everyone adjusts at the same pace. So coming out of high school, you're going to have a different adjustment period. And it's really important to know that. And also build a very strong support circle. They're your friends, your family, on-campus resources. You could find on-campus support groups as well. And really try to join as many clubs and extracurriculars only if you're interested. Don't force yourself to do anything. And I'd say coming into university, maybe 
the, like a week before, two weeks of two weeks before, look into potential note taking apps and, you know, assignment trackers to help you have a foundation that you can change and adjust based on how your lectures are going. So, you know, if you know your lectures are very math heavy, science heavy, you might need something to follow along. Look into something that you can download your PDFs to help you follow along in lecture. And if your classes are lecture heavy, like, you know, very just like, you know, you're listening to the professor talk a lot, see what can work best for you, whether it's writing or typing. And, you know, having a foundation set up can really help you adjust easily so you're not as lost. Yeah, one tip I have for a successful transition from high school to university would be to make connections with those in your program. So this could look like introducing yourself to someone you're sitting next to you during the first week of classes. And this can be really helpful to have, you know, that point of contact for discussing upcoming assignments, studying together, maybe comparing notes and so much more. And it kind of mirrors that aspect of high school where maybe you're more familiar with those in your classroom. So that's one tip I'd have for the transition. A tip that I have in regard to making friends is to try finding friends in places where you spend a lot of time. So it might be daunting to talk to someone you see in class like once a week rather than someone, for example, that is your neighbor in residence that you see almost every day. Remember that everyone is in the same place as you and everyone is looking for friends too. So don't be afraid to put yourself out there. I found that homesickness was a strong feeling for me. So another tip I have is to set up regular times to talk to family back home if you want to. So you feel that connection and they do too, uh, because I'm sure they miss you just as much. Awesome, those are some really great tips, guys. Um, thank you so much. Um, if I had to say one tip myself, it would probably just be be kind to yourself through this whole process. It's a really big transition and adjusting it adjusting can take time. Um, so just give yourself some grace. It's okay if things aren't perfect. Um, you have lots of time to figure out the best routine for yourself and so many resources to help you do so. Perfection is impossible. And I think that's something you just really need to remind yourself of. Um, just doing your best and having fun and enjoying your university experience will make you so much more resilient. We move into our next question. So our next question we have is how did you find community, celebrate your culture, and connect with other students here at Queens? I'll bring it back to our panelists, provide their answers and insights first. Awesome. So I found a lot of my community through my courses and residence in first year. If you're not in residence, I highly recommend um, joining the off-campus community um, to build connections with people, um, just because I know you're not necessarily living right next to students, but it's a great way to meet other students, um, and they do a lot of socials and stuff, but for me personally, um, I lived on West Campus, so I had a very tight-knit community there, and also in my tutorial and lab groups, um, I met a lot of people throughout my courses who ended up being my friends throughout university as well. Um, once I established that support group and became more comfortable um, in my experience here at Queens, I started to join more extracurriculars and jobs and I met many people through those experiences as well. So I joined a lot of student government and other personal interest clubs. I really suggest um, doing things that you like because that really helps find your people, like very like-minded people. Um, also, if you're struggling with culture or just identity-based um, connection on campus, there's a lot of great groups to check out. So I suggest Yellow House and Four Directions, and there's so many more, you can just like literally search them up and you will find them. There's so many great identity-based groups on campus as well. So in my first year, I found a lot of my community in residence and in a lot of my classes. So I wasn't very active on campus in my first year and like I am now, but I connected with a lot of people by volunteering together, struggling through assignments together, and attending lots of residence-led events. So I later on joined clubs and extracurriculars like you know Queen's Red Cross and the Campus Observation Room, which really let me get involved with the Queen's community through you know, for a good cause. 
And a great way to stay connected with your culture, I would say, is to um, join cultural supports and clubs. So there are various clubs, and like Alice said before, you can literally search them up. Um, a great place to start is actually to search them up on social media and follow along with those pages because um, there's a lot of events held throughout the year. So just following along will help you keep up, keep up to date, and definitely, definitely attend at least one or a few if you're interested. And, you know, you can really find a lot of people that you have things in common with. And, you know, community is something that's always growing as time goes on and really getting in getting involved with campus events and extracurriculars is a great way to start. Because if you're already doing something together, you already have something in common. Yeah, so for myself, I found community at Queen's through joining clubs and pursuing opportunities that were centered around my personal interests and passions. So for example, I've always loved performing. And so many of the friends I've made during my time at Queen's have been through performing in Queen's musical theater or dance school productions. And so echoing what my peers have said, I highly, highly encourage you to seek out opportunities um, to connect with other students on the basis of your passions um, and shared experiences, as this can really help also with maintaining that balance between academics and in your personal life. Finding my different than everyone because I was coming back from Bader, which was an international Queens campus in the UK. Um, everyone was going into the second year and it seemed like they already had friends they had made in first year. So I really relied on social media when I was abroad to find my community. Um, and I made friends virtually. So when I was back, I had a group of friends that I was comfortable talking to. Social media and Rafter are a great way to make virtual friends. So you could potentially build a community before school even starts. Um, in terms of culture, I find, I find that Queens has a lot of cultural clubs and associations that you can join um, and or just go to events for. For example, we have uh, the Queen South Asian Association, and it felt like a piece of home when I went to events like the Diwali Formal, for example. Awesome. Those sounds like some really great ideas, guys. For me, as many others have mentioned, I found my community through my passions and joining some of the clubs that are here at Queen's. Um, I've been a dancer for most of my life, so I really found connection with the Queen's Dance Club and the Vogue Charity Fashion Show because I could connect with other dancers through that shared love for the art. Alma Matter Society, you'll see a club directory with all the different clubs on campus. Here, I'm sure you'll find a club or multiple clubs um, that resonate with you. Um, it's beyond worth it to put yourself out there. Even if you aren't fully confident, definitely try something new or join a club. Moving on to our next question. This is our final um, frequently asked question before we open the Q&A. Um, what is your favorite thing to do in Kingston during the school year? I'll pass it back to our speakers one final time to give their input. Um, just quickly, I apologize if I freeze in here. I can totally repeat anything for my answer. Um, but for me personally, I really love going to Kingston specific events. There are so many and like you can literally just tailor them to your personal interests. For me, I'm a film and media major. I love film. So having two uh, big film festivals in Kingston every year is amazing. Um, those two are like the Kingston Canadian Film Festival and the Real Lab Queer Film Festival. So those are my favorites. I go to them every single year. Um, but there's many accounts that post um, different like events and opportunities on the Queens campus. So I know one really great one that I followed since my first year is Queens events, which posts like everything that's happening from things going on on Queens campus to things off campus as well. Um, um, there's so many great local small businesses here that are like just amazing. Like some of the best food I've ever tried is in Kingston. So I really recommend like walking down Princess Street and like choosing a restaurant there because you probably will not be disappointed. Um, My favorite thing to do in Kingston is definitely to take walks by the pier. 
Um, I think I think it's one of the best benefits of going to school in a city that's right by the water. Um, when it's warmer, warmer, I'll take a book with me or my headphones to listen to some music, you know, just to decompress after a long day because stool, school can get stressful. So it's really nice, especially because it's always warmer down by like, you know, your finals and your second semester. And also coming into September, you guys might want to go check it out as often as possible while you can. And I also look forward to city-led events that run throughout the year. So there's always something to do with your friends and on your own if you're interested. And the local events are honestly great. The community here is great. So don't be afraid to step out of the campus and really just take a walk downtown. Yeah, one of my favorite things to do in Kingston during the school year definitely has to also be going for walks by the water. Um, I love being located so close to the pier and sometimes that'll mean a walk with my friend and sometimes it's just me, myself and my headphones um, and kind of furthering that as well, walking down Princess Street and going to different coffee shops and exploring the different local businesses is definitely a highlight of being in Kingston and living, um, you know, and going to a school with a campus that's so close to such a pretty downtown and a, a pretty water area. So that has to be mine. Uh, I'm not someone who feels the best staying inside all the time, which is why I love that Kingston, uh, Queens is right on the water, like everyone previously mentioned. Uh, Kingston is a big reason why I chose Queens in the first place. I love how all of Kingston is either walkable and or connected through public transit. So transit for the year is covered in the ancillary fees you pay. So all you have to do is show your student card to ride the bus. I love going to the mall, which is the Cataraqui Center, and trying new restaurants because there are so, so many local restaurants downtown, like Alice mentioned previously, um, there's an answer for every single food craving for sure. I don't have a car here myself, and I feel like I'm not lacking in any way because of the walk walkability and public transit system. Um, the best thing about Kingston is that there is always a new activity to do. I'm going into my fourth year, and there are still new activities I want to do here, like the escape rooms, bowling, axe throwing, etc. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Extremely walkable city. Um, I personally really like going for walks in general, um, especially when those walks lead me to a really nice coffee shop, which Kingston has a ton of amazing coffee shops downtown. Um, there's also a Common Ground coffee shop on campus, which is also referred to as Cogro, which is a super nice place to get work done. Um, so I love sitting with like a little sweet treat, my headphones on, and just working away. Um, overall, the coffee shop study sessions are probably my, probably my favorite Kingston activity during the year. Awesome. So the floor is now yours for the Q panelists and myself are here to answer any questions that you have for the transition to university, student experience, or anything else that's Queens related. Uh, please use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen to send in your questions and feel free to use the anonymous feature if it makes you more comfortable too. We did some background on all of the students here today, what program they're in, their year of study, and how they've been involved during their time here at Queens. Feel free to ask questions about any other details listed on the slide as well. Awesome, so moving into our first question, the student wants to know how do they minor in classes? Does anyone have any experience with a minor or know anyone that does quite well? I can take this one. So um, if you're in arts and science and you're looking to minor in classics, um, something called plan selection happens at the end of first year. Being a minor, as you mentioned, um, at the end of your first year. What's really great about that is, you know, you can go into first year and you can take, um, you know, different classes and you can take um, first year classics classes, but um, you have the whole year kind of decide if that's what you want to declare a plan in. Um, and so don't worry, you will get an email at the end of your first year, but when it's time to declare a, a major and a minor, so just make sure that you're checking your email um, regularly because it will certainly, there'll be reminders that are, that are sent out. And something I'll also mention really briefly is that even if after your first year, um, you don't declare that minor, but you decide you want to later on in your academic career. I know me personally, um, I have a two teachable 
minor in my fourth year because I had the the requirements and I filled them anyway. So just something to keep in mind in terms of the flexibility with your degree plan during your time at Queens. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Massimo. Um, I so I originally um, had a minor in math, but I actually dropped my minor. So it's an option you have to keep it or drop it. And there are some benefits of both. Um, I really enjoyed it, but I decided not to keep it so that I have more option to take different additional basic qualifications as a teacher. So it's really up to you. Um, I know that my housemates through my years of university did minors and stuff. So um, it's completely up to you. I just want to remind you that you have all the freedom in the world with your degree. Awesome. Our next question it might be one that's really good for you, Kirit. Um, so this student wants to know what electives that you'd recommend taking in biochemistry or life science um, for them entering their first year. So what are some courses maybe you took in your first year or that you wish you took in your first? All right, thank you for the question, Jonah. Um, so I was a direct entry student into the life science and biochemistry stream. So we, honestly, I only had room for one elective first year. And um, the elective that I took was um, Health 101. So that is a very nice course to take, um, especially when a lot of your other courses are very strenuous. It just kind of takes a different approach and you really get to learn about the history of healthcare and how it impacts minorities and small groups um, across the world, globally and internationally, also locally. So um, do look into other electives that you may be interested in, but um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of wiggle room um, I've heard some of my friends took Anatomy 100. Some of them um, honestly took upper year courses just to try and like, you know, get a move on, but um, go at your own pace. See what courses work for you. And as always, you can always pull up syllabus syllabi from the um, Queen's Exam Bank and Syllabus Bank. I believe it's a universal um, resource that you guys get. And just Pick up a syllabi, read it, see if it interests you, and all. And you can always resort to emailing upper year students. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, to um get input. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kirit. Um, I'm gonna open it to anyone else who wants to just give some insight to maybe what electives they took in their first year and what courses they enjoyed as a first year student. Because the whole point of an elective is you can take something outside of your area of study if you want. So. Did anyone take any really awesome electives? Yeah, um, in my first year uh, in health sciences, I think I had two electives. I took health 101 as well, personal health and wellness. Um, and I also took history of pop music, which was really, really cool. We learned a lot about like Hendrix and stuff like that. It was It was a really cool experience for me. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much, Ravenski. Um, the next question that we have is a general one that probably any of us can answer um, because it's about planning courses and we all have lots of experience with that. Um, so this student wants to know what the purpose of course planning is and if we have any tips for being prepared for the course enrollment process. So does anyone want to speak up on what they did prior to course enrollment in their past few years? Um, I can start us off. For me, I like to be very organized around course planning time because I'm a person who tends to get very stressed out in situations like this. So for me, I start by going through all the different courses that I can take. I remember going into my first year, um, I was a general arts student. So the options are kind of endless in that stream. Uh, you can take any different arts course because you declare your major um, at the end of your first year. So for me, I knew for sure as a film major, I wanted to take the uh, intro film course. I believe that's now split into two courses. 
Um, and then from there, I looked through things that would interest me, things that I maybe would want to minor in as well. Um, so I, in my first year, I took a bunch of different courses, including drama, politics, sociology, gender studies. I even took a computing course in my first year just to really give myself like a broad variety. Um, so for me, I like write them down in a little planner and I see if any of the times interfere with each other because that's also a big issue when it comes to course planning. So making sure nothing interferes with each other. And then I make sure to use, I believe the course shopping cart opens July 15th this year, um, but adding those to my cart before the day of enrollment. And my biggest tip for you is like joining a course enrollment webinar. I remember during my course enrollment period, I did not realize there was a button to switch through the different tutorials. And I got really scared that I didn't make it into one and ended up having to call the school. So like really knowing the features of Solace because it's a very specific and um, you probably don't have used it anywhere else. Um, so knowing like which buttons you need to click and like really getting yourself familiar with the platform before course enrollment time comes. Um, me personally, again, like Alice, I also prefer to stay very organized prior to course enrollment. It really is just something that helps you take away a little bit of stress um, when the time comes around. And definitely enrolling in one of those webinars is the best thing you can do for yourself because like Alice said before, you have not used a program like Solus before. So it's really nice to have um, some upper year students and pro staff um, really walk you through the program, show you little tips and tricks and um, kind of just explain. Because I remember during my course enrollment, I tried to refresh the page and I had to log back in because it's crazy. But, um, Great advice, Alice. Um, I would also recommend uh, setting up your um, setting up a planner to sort of stimulate a timetable. So you're gonna probably look into what classes you'd like to take. You'll be able to view the different times and days of the week that the class is held. And you can sort of set up your own makeshift timetable prior to enrollment. So you can also set up two, three, you know, just whichever one works with your schedule, which times of classes you would prefer. And that's just something that helps you view. Like if the time you want fills up, you have a backup option ready to sort of like, you know, shift everything around and you'll still be able to take the classes you like. Awesome, thanks Kirit. Um, just to give a quick kind of insight, um, I found it was super helpful to definitely make those simulated um, course schedules. I really liked using a program called Corsicle, which is online and it's free. And you can make multiple versions of your timetable and click between them. So you can kind of see how they compare to each other or how different options would compare. Um, I also know people that would print off um, a timetable and then they just color in the blocks of time which each class would be. And they'd have the printout just be Monday through Friday. So that's also a really great option if you are a pencil and paper kind of person. Moving into the next question we have, this might be a good one for you, Ravathy, because it's about online classes and how science has a lot of those. Um, but this student just wants to know how online classes work kind of generally, and if anyone has any experience in online classes. Yeah, so thank you for the question, Jonah. I have taken some online classes and basically how it works is it um, you have the class and you're on cue just like every other class. And but it's kind of very much more self-directed in the sense that you don't have like a professor telling you every week when your assignment is due, um, but you there's always like a timeline tab and it'll show you when assignments are due um, and it'll have links to what the assignment actually is. So you kind of just have to go at your own pace and submit assignments when they're due and usually these classes have like discussion posts and stuff that you can interact with other classmates um in uh because you 
in in-person classes, a lot of health side classes, you have a lot of collaboration and discussion in class. So when those classes are online, um, for to have that discussion element, a lot of professors use the discussion post um, tab. So yeah, everything is always listed in the syllabus. So please look at your syllabus um, first week of class. And also it'll be listed in the announcements in OnCue, it'll be listed in your timeline. So please look at the timeline. There's like a tab in your class um, on Q and it'll say timeline and you click on it and it'll give you like the full 12 week breakdown. So that's what I would recommend. Yeah, I've taken a couple of arts and science online classes and have definitely had like a similar experience. Many of those um, classes will use the timeline feature on Anki, which is really great. It's one place that you can just scroll and see, you know, what the content is for each week. And there's often like hyperlinks directly to to readings in the case of the classes that I'm taking. Um, something I'll say about online classes that is that each one does look a little bit different. And so I've had some that do have um, like a weekly like Zoom or um, meeting of some sort that happens online and other classes, it's just like an optional drop-in session, um, almost like a virtual office hours. And so when you, if you are enrolling in online classes, just having a look at the syllabus as you would for any in-person class and having a feel for how that individual class organizes itself can be really helpful. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Um, I've also taken some online courses and um, some of the online courses I've taken have been some of my favorites. So I would definitely say they're a great option if you're looking at the courses here at Queens. And it was really nice to have that flexibility in when you would complete your work uh, because they are often module based. Um, the next question that we do have is about um, Kingston being a walk walkable and cyclable city. So the student wants to know if they can slash not have to worry about bringing a car. Um, so does anyone have any insights into their traveling at Queens? Yeah, so like I mentioned before, um, Kingston is extremely walkable and Queens is situated um, first year you live on campus and even second year when you're off campus, you're near the campus. So you will be near downtown no matter what. So you can definitely walk. But also there are other places in Kingston, um, like the mall, the cat center that are definitely not walkable. It's like co -op. You have public transit. So the public transit, transit fees are covered in your ancillary fees that you pay at the beginning of the year. And through that, you get like a sticker on your student card. And whenever you board a bus, you can, you can just show that sticker and you can enter the bus. And this is like for the entire year, you can go as many times as you want on the bus. So I live a little bit further from campus. So walking downtown is not always an option for me um, when the weather is bad. So I love to take the bus because there are bus stops everywhere and you can take the bus anywhere in Kingston. So I don't have a car either and I don't feel like I am losing out on anything. Yeah, I would just echo that and say you can definitely graduate from Queens without um, knowing how to drive. I personally, my G1 just expired, so I do have to get on that. But the reason why I've been able to go that far, even being my fifth year at Queens, is because Kingston is so walkable. Um, and also, yeah, the transit is great as well. And um, you're able to take the transit with your student card. So no stress there. Um, hence why, yeah, I got to get on that this summer because I want to be in Kingston forever. So. <laughs> For sure. I definitely think um, it's something great to think about having a car here because sometimes it does make things easier, but it definitely is not necessary by any means. Um, I oftentimes took the bus to get groceries um, in my upper years, or if my friends want to go to the mall, we'd all take the bus together. And even just doing things like that turn into a nice group outing um, because you all know you can take the bus. So definitely worth it to spend the time walking around Kingston and taking public transit. If you don't have a vehicle, I would not stress too hard about that. The next question we have is about the meal plan. So this student wants to know how the meal plan is. They've heard that they get approximately 19 meals per week. Um, and so they wanna know if like they could live off purely the meal plan or if they'd have to be finding um, meals elsewhere as well. Does anyone have any experience with the meal plan? 
Um, for me personally, I actually really enjoyed the meal plan. I really like the flexibility of, of course, I lived on West, so I had a dining hall like in my building, but also when I was on campus, I always knew I could get food as well. Um, for me, obviously the 19 meals were a bit of a concern, but I found, um, personally, I ended up getting my own breakfast. Um, so sometimes my family would bring that up for me or I would buy it myself because there's a lot of places like Metro, Loblaws, um, even like Tim Hortons around that are great, um, for, uh, getting foods like that. Um, you also have um, a few flex dollars on top of your meal plan. I believe it's about 100 that you can use throughout the year as well. And you can always reload that if you need. So if you're really worried about the 19 meals, you can still continue using your student card. Um, with those extra flex dollars, just let people know wherever you're buying your food from that you want to pay on flex dollars as well. So I never, I actually ended up always under my meals every week, um, but it just depends on how you plan to do your meals as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Alice. Um, I also was and I had a meal plan and I found that I also was not having all 19 meals per week. Um, I know a lot of my friends did three meals during the day, um, during the school week, so Monday through Friday, and then two meals on weekends, but it's entirely up to you and it's entirely feasible to use only the 19 meals um, per week and just live off of that. Um, I found it was honestly really filling. Queens has a lot of great options in terms of food and there's always something that you'll eat so you never find yourself stranded in terms of that. Next question we have is about uh, moving to Kingston or Canada. So if any of you were an international student, uh, what was it like adjusting to life in Kingston or Canada or just moving to a new city in general for those that are um, from Canada or interprovince? Um, I grew, like, I mostly grew up in Ontario and I was not an international student, but I did go abroad for my first year at Bader. Um, so I, so coming back to Kingston and coming to Queens, I was coming from an international setting, if that makes sense. Um, and I found that, like I said, because I wasn't in Kingston and Queens with everyone else, um, I found that I really relied on social media to make friends, to make connections. Um, I would suggest Instagram, Rafter, whatever works for you, whatever you're comfortable with. And um, I found that when I came from that international setting, I found like I had more of a community and I didn't feel as daunting coming back. Also, I know that, um, no, I don't know where I was going with that train of thought. But yeah, I would try to connect with people on social media, um, especially if you're not from uh, Kingston or like just in general, if you're traveling to Kingston in any sort of way and you're not familiar with um, the area. Something I would just want to briefly um, recommend checking actually opens this week and so if you are looking to connect directly with an upper year student um, who maybe also has a similar experience being an international student coming to Queens um, you're able to indicate that on your mentee profile and mentors do the same and so you can form um, a connection I recommend keeping an eye out for, for key success registration on the student experience office website this week Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Massimo. You cut out just a little bit. So just to kind of summarize, um, Q Success is a really great option we have here at Queens that allows you to be partnered up with an upper year student. So if you're looking for someone that's had that experience being international um, or just adjusting to Kingston itself as a new city, um, it's a really great option to just look into. And registration for that opens this, I believe, Friday, actually, which is super exciting. So definitely look into it. Um, and you can find it on our website. So definitely check it out and ask away any questions you have about that. 
The next question that we have um, is for anyone to answer. So this student wants to know how many clubs we were joining approximately in our first year or in our time at Queens and how we managed balancing out our academic course loads with those extracurriculars. Um, the student wants to find out about all the clubs and the extracurriculars that Queens offers. So maybe we can start with how you guys found the clubs that you found, and then we talk about how you balanced your course load with it. Yeah, so something that's been me uh, mentioned that was really helpful for me is like the AMS clubs directory. So if you search that resource up, you can actually filter through clubs on the basis of your interests and what you would like to participate in. Um, and in terms of balancing clubs and academics, I found that um, I found a really strong sense of community through joining clubs. And so being able to have classes, you know, during the day and then have club meetings or performances and whatnot in the evenings was a really great, great way for me to personally feel like I was balancing um, um, being a student at Queens and also being a student who wants to meet like-minded individuals um, beyond the context of the classroom. And so in terms of balancing that, I just think um, when you look at your class schedule, finding where you do have those gaps um, where you can do sort of the, the work that doesn't happen in the classroom. So maybe that's stopping at the library in between classes, or maybe that's knowing that you have this evening free, so you're going to tackle this assignment um, because the rest of your evenings are maybe occupied with some other clubs you're a part of. I think it definitely takes some some forethought and some and as long as you are kind of asking yourself those questions um it's really possible to balance clubs and academics and you have all your time at queens to just get better at that and find a structure that works for you because it looks different for everybody yeah definitely so um during my first year at queens like i said before i wasn't very involved with campus but um what i found myself doing was that i joined a few clubs later on in the year so with most clubs, that is an option, actually, to join as a general member. Um, I think I joined in my second semester once I had gotten the hold of, like, you know, university academics because I didn't really want to rush into anything. But one thing to keep in mind is that with clubs, um, they have a sort of structure and different roles in a club have different time commitments. So you can always pick something that works best for you. I know some of the clubs I'm in have a time commitment for two to three hours a week, while others... Um, they'd like a little more. So just like, you know, or less, actually, like one by month, like a biweekly meeting for general members. Um, so really just uh, do, a do a bit of research. The AMS directory is a great place to start. And, you know, coming into Queens now, it would be nice to start looking at things that you're interested in. And when the time for enrollment comes around, um, you'll kind of have an idea of hmm, how involved do I really want to get? And also, um, during orientation, um, there will be a Queens in the Park event, which is a great place to sort of, sort of talk to current club members and their representatives and just see if something's the right fit for you. So definitely don't rush into it. Take your time, but also don't be afraid of trying something new because you're afraid of the time commitment or you're afraid that um, you won't be able to keep up with your academics. There's lots of options out there and 100% you'll be able to find a great fit for you. Awesome. I just want to completely echo what Kira just said. It's so important for you to get involved. Um, you can really find community with that. So definitely go for it. A lot of clubs are um, really helpful in terms of like, if you have a large course load and you join a club, then you still want to be in the club and, um, a lot of them will alter how um, you can be integrated into the club scene and stuff like that, um, just to make sure that you can still participate, but also be successful in your academics. So it's definitely worth it. I wouldn't say that being um, involved is impossible by any means. So definitely look into it. Um, I also know as a first year student, there are a lot of first year intern positions that come out with clubs as well. So if you're looking to get involved kind of in executive roles, then you can definitely look into um, the clubs you want to look into and ask if they have a first year intern position. The next question we have is about courses. So this student wants to know if it's a bad idea to have three classes back to back during their day in their schedule. So they want to know if they should be scheduling any time between their classes or how that works. Do they don't have any insight? So first year, um... Again, I was in the um, life science and biochemistry um, stream. So um, I had 
morning classes that were back to back. Most days um, during the week, there were three classes. Some days there were two. And um, one thing that I found just because they were um, a mandatory requirement for me, I didn't have many options with those classes. However, um, one thing I did find is that um, the 10 minute break between those lectures back to back, if they're in the same lecture hall, um, are a great time to, you know, maybe get a coffee run, take a bathroom break, or just give yourself a little break in general. Like, you know, I used to love shutting down my computer during those 10 minutes to pretend that I was anywhere but in that lecture hall. But um, they honestly, they're not too bad. It also frees up the rest of your day somehow. So um, when you're done with those classes, you get back, you really have um, time to decompress, um, eat lunch properly, take, take a nap. You know, take a longer break than you would if you had, say, another class in an, in an hour and two hours. Um, you're still going to be in go, go, go mode. Um, but if your classes are in different lecture halls, I feel that um, the 10 minutes in between classes are a suitable time period to get from one lecture to another. I would not recommend it if one class is on West Campus and one class is on Main Campus because that um, does require a longer travel time. But um, to walk from one end of campus to another within 10 minutes is possible. It's not impossible. You might feel a little rushed, but um, it's definitely doable. Awesome. Thanks, Kirit. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely look out for scheduling classes on West Campus and on Main Campus. Um, but for all classes, if it says it ends at um, 10.30, for example, you'll always get out 10 minutes earlier than that time. So you'll get out at 10.20, take your time to walk across campus. So definitely don't be too stressed about that option too. Looking at our next question, um, we can answer this briefly, but a student wants to know that when, a student wants to know when we were in first year, when we started looking for second year housing and when specifically we signed the lease. Um, they want to know if we met all of our housemates in residence or how you guys met your housemates if you didn't. Yeah, so um, because I was abroad first year, I was like, I need to get on second year housing as soon as possible. And I started looking in October. And a great place to look is on Facebook. There's um, a group for off-campus housing. And there you could they have listings they have um students list like uh landlords list they'll be like one bedroom one bathroom or like they'll they'll give you like what the house has the amenities and the rent and everything and you can like message if you're interested i started looking in like october end of october and i signed my lease like mid november um i think you can, that's when a lot of people do look, but if you're, if you look after winter break too, that's, that's totally fine. It's up to you. There's always like new listings pop, uh, popping up because a lot of people, um, like fourth years or people that are about to graduate, um, might end their lease or people that don't know if they're going to renew their lease might decide later. So, um, I would definitely look closer to the end of first term, but if you look, near the beginning of second term or during that time, that's okay too. And look on Facebook. Yeah, for me personally, I signed my lease for second year in November of first year. Um, and because for my first year, it was online, um, first semester, I wasn't in residence. And so I met my current roommates through um, being in group chats because we were in the same program. And so um, similar to um, what Ravithi was saying um, in being in Facebook groups or um, group chats with uh, people in your program or generally looking for off-campus housing. I will say, though, that for those living in residence or off-campus community housing and first year um those that can definitely be a time where you can meet potential roommates um and i know that um, i have peers who lived in residence in first semester of first year and formed um second year housing um at the end of september or in october and so um it really just varies on your own personal experience but i definitely um agree that it's usually first semester of first year um towards the middle to an end of that where people start thinking about housing for the next year and signing leases Sorry, I just wanted to jump in really quickly. I actually did not know any of my roommates before signing my lease, um, which is totally fine. If you don't have um, 
people that you know you want to live with for next year, that's totally okay too. There, are, you can um, rent directly from the landlord, and basically, the people that I ended up rooming with, I didn't really know, but I did become friends with them over time with living with them. Just that's an option too. Option. That's that's really great, guys. Um, just quickly, we've been a lot of questions about course selection and registration. So just to give a quick overview for everyone on this webinar. Um, if you're in one of the following courses, you'll have some or all of your courses selected automatically and added to your schedule by your faculty or school. Um, so if you're in commerce, concurrent education, music, nursing, kinesiology, engineering and applied science, health science, or life sciences and biochemistry's direct entry stream, um, some of your courses or all of them are added. So make note of this. If you're not in these programs, you will have to choose all of your courses during the course selection process. Um, students who choose some or all of their courses are able to see their enrollment appointment time in Solus at the beginning of July. So this is also when you could add courses to your shopping cart. Um, for students in health sciences, there's also a course registration webinar happening July 10th from 5 to 6 p.m. Um, so check your email for the information regarding that. And for anyone in arts and science who has to choose their courses, there is course registration webinars happening the entire week of July 15th. Um, so definitely visit the link in the chat for more information on this or check out our website um, and to find out which session is for you. If you have any questions specifically, um, also reach out to your faculty. They're there to support you. So they'll definitely answer any questions you have. Um, or feel free to ask us on Rafter as well. And we'll try and answer as best we can as upper year students. Um, seeing as we don't have too much time left, we're just going to answer one more question. And I think we could all take a chance to answer this. Um, so this student wants to know, what is something that you did or wish you did in the summer before your first year that helped you prepare for your transition? Um, for me, I was somebody who was super nervous. I deal with a lot of anxiety, um, which some of you here um, might already, some of you might, you know, start to feel this way. Uh, entering university, it's a big change. Um, so for me, I didn't really get to tour Queens um, before I came here um, because it was during COVID. Um, but I personally, now knowing about it, wish I went to SOAR. Um, I would have really benefited from experiencing campus, meeting new people, like learning about all these resources. Because when I came here, I truly only really knew one person super well, and everything else was completely new to me, which isn't necessarily a situation I tend to thrive in. So something like SOAR would have really benefited me and made me feel a lot more comfortable entering campus, um, learning about different resources, experiencing residents, um, and help adapt to my new environment. I would also recommend um, following the SEO on Instagram as well for more updates. There's so many like great first year programs that like I didn't know about when I was entering my first year. So um, keeping in communication or following wherever um, to stay like, um, to stay connected with the resources that are available. All right. Um, so in my first year, I really wish I had taken the time to learn about campus resources. Um, I attended SOAR and I feel like it was one of the best decisions I made because I really got to connect with my peers. And um, I really got and even if I like, you know, even if we weren't in the same program, we really got the opportunity to bounce questions off of each other and stay in touch. And that really helped us out throughout the first week. Um, at university, which is very crucial. So it was really nice to have everyone there. Yeah, so the summer before my first year, I hung out with my high school friends. 
as much as I possibly could, especially the friends that I knew were going to different schools. Um, I try to hang out with them as frequently as possible. And I also tried to plan ahead times um, or days that we could video call to catch up. It definitely helped me with my sort of homesick feeling and like feeling like I had to wait until reading week or winter break to see them. Um, and I felt good about communicating with my longtime friends, even as I made new ones um, during my first year in university. Yeah, something that was really helpful for me would, uh, was joining group chats and meeting those who were in my program. So I definitely recommend checking out Rafter. And as I mentioned earlier, Q Success is also a great opportunity. I wish I had signed up to be a mentee because connecting with an upper year student in my program would be a great way to ask questions that are specific to the program I was going into, which was Con Ed. So thank you. It was lovely to chat with you all today. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Um, thank you, everyone, for your amazing questions. We know we haven't answered all of them, so we do encourage you to reach out to us and your peer ambassadors on Rafter for more information. Uh, you can also email student.experience at queensu.ca with any additional questions that you have. As many of you know, this isn't the only webinar that we have planned. All summer, we're hosting webinars with different topics to help answer any questions that you have. Um, some upcoming ones that we have are the Arts and Science, Everything You Need to Know, going into first year webinar happening July 9th from 5 to 6 p.m. The Arts and Science for Indigenous Students webinar happening July 10th from 9 to 10 a.m. And the Resident Self-Selection webinar happening July 10th from 6 to 7 p.m. As we mentioned previously, if you're in the Faculty of Arts and Science, you really don't wanna miss your course registration webinars that are happening the week of July 15th and 19th. Um, so make sure you check those out. Uh, the schedule is posted on our webinar page on the SEO website. Um, but if you can't make it, the recordings of all these sessions are posted on YouTube on the Queen's Student Experience Office channel, too. We also have some in-person events like the Summer Orientation to Academics and Resources, or SOAR, being held on campus July 5th through 7th, as well as the 12th through 13th. Um, and then virtually, we'll have our virtual social, the very first one being Tricolor Trivia on July 11th from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern. All of these are really great options if you're looking to meet your peers, get information, and get better acquainted with Queens. To refresh you all as well, we have a short checklist for you to use as a guide following this webinar. So firstly, make sure you register for SOAR if you can, um, and then check your Queens email because there's information about Rafter, Q Success, updates from us at the SEO, as well as the monthly newsletter. Um, and then finally, make sure you visit the Next Steps website as we have tons of details about all of our upcoming events and webinars on there. Awesome. Well, that concludes our very first Ask Away Upper Year Q&A panel. The next one will be happening early in August, so make sure to tune back in then. Thank you again for all of our panelists for the time this morning, the SEO staff for supporting us all in the back end, and everyone at home for attending. As a reminder, this Q&A is recorded, so if you weren't able to make it or you have a friend that wants to see it, it'll be posted on the SEO webpage under webinars within the next week, so feel free to check it out again. We hope you have a great rest of your day, and hopefully we'll see you at our other events. Take care, everyone.